choices. Every day we make all kinds of choices and we have the freedom to make them. What time we get up in the morning, what we might have to eat, how we may go to work or to school or to appointments that we have during the day, what time we will return and what we may do in the evening with our spare time and to refresh ourselves. There are some that we may not see as everyday type of choices, but rather choices that have a greater significance. Today we'll explore choices set before us in today's lessons. We'll focus on Jesus' message in the Gospel reading and how it speaks to us today. The idea of freedom flows through all of the readings today. In Deuteronomy, Moses reminds the people of Israel that they have the freedom to choose between life and prosperity or death and adversity. Ironically, this freedom to choose life comes through the freedom to choose obedience to the commands of God. In other words, Moses tells the people that they're free to choose bondage to God and life or bondage to sin and death. Either way, they'll be bound to something. In the second reading, Paul reminds Philemon that he, Paul, is not free, but is a prisoner of Jesus Christ. This is Paul's way to help convince Philemon to free his slave, Onesimus. Paul reminds him that he has the freedom to hold on to his slave and the freedom to choose to release Onesimus as his brother in Christ. In the Gospel reading, Jesus speaks some very challenging words, which resonate in ways that might make us more than a bit uncomfortable. Does Jesus really want you to hate your family? Of course not. This passage from Luke is a good reminder to us that we must interpret scripture by relying on the context of each book, each story, and even each verse. Taken literally, Jesus is advocating for his disciples to hate, which is so contrary to his consistent message of love. This passage I'm sure is a challenge to all of us. It was certainly a challenge to me. And so uh, I spent some time in my study Bible really trying to understand the question, what? And the good news is, as it's the habit of the Holy Spirit, when I open up God's word, he guided me to just what I needed. And um, to me, this is, um, yeah, my study Bible is a great companion. My dear friend Ed Kramer, one time in a meeting when I pulled it out, referred to it as the Bible with the answers. And this was the answer it had for me with regard to this passage, and I wanted to share it with you because it will do a much better job of explaining this passage than I could myself. Jesus' comments here are an example of hyperbole, a figure of speech that exaggerates for emphasis, Jesus was setting up an extreme contrast to make a point. Our passion for Jesus should be so strong and so committed that our affection for our families could, by comparison, be considered almost hatred. By setting up such an exaggerated contrast, Jesus was describing the total commitment required from his disciples. We know Jesus was not literally calling us to hate our families. The balance of biblical teaching tells us to honor our parents and to love others. Jesus was establishing priorities. We owe an unqualifying loyalty and love to God. Then, because we put him first, we are to love each other. The two actually go hand in hand.
interpreting that verse as hyperbole, we can understand the point that Jesus is making. He is ultimately calling people to a relational priority, not demanding intense hostility towards family or even life itself. He is prompting his followers to refuse to allow something less valuable to get in the way or displace something more valuable, choosing to put and to keep God first. Today's gospel begins with a reminder of the large crowds that had begun to follow Jesus. Crowds filled with amazement at witnessing Jesus' power over demons and disease and disabilities. Jesus has been sought by many longing to hear his wise teachings and be healed of their afflictions. Jesus has seen the crowds growing, and he knows that some of these followers may only be tagging along in order to see another miracle. Perhaps some of them are following only because they've been caught up in the mob mentality that has begun to develop around Jesus and his disciples in all that they were doing. We can imagine that many of the crowd did not know or fully understand what they were doing and exactly who it was that they were following. Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem for a cross, but the crowd thinks that he's on his way to Jerusalem for a crown. They consider Jesus a winner, so they follow him, that they too might win. In the gospel today, Jesus asked the disciples to consider carefully their call to discipleship as they follow him. He uses the metaphor of a builder in verses 28 through 30 and a king going to war in verses 31 to 32 and then concludes with a call to give up all of your possessions. Like the hyperbole of hating family members, the teaching here is that the disciples need to be released from any attachment to other things or gods in their lives in order to have the freedom to live out the new reality of their discipleship. But it's not without its cost. And for some, a great cost. And for many of his early followers, a cost even to death. In a consumer culture that holds tightly to possessions, Jesus' words speak directly to our modern possession-focused world and us today. The offering from the Old Testament invites us to reflect on what we bound down to in this life. Moses suggests that it's an either-or choice. Do we give ourselves to life-giving things or to things that wage death in this world? Imagine the gods that we can get caught up in or bound down or bow down to, like fame, wealth, prestige, a perfectly curated social media presence, a family reputation that is front and center on our Christmas card. What has a hold of you in this world? Your bank account? Your reputation? Similar to the Old Testament reading in Luke, Jesus is asking the crowd following him if they understand that he is more than a curiosity. He's talking about radical action. In the ancient world, your status and identity came mainly from your family ties. So when Jesus invites his followers to consider giving up family identity as their primary source of self, in order to get that sense of self from God first, he's doing something unique and he gets their attention. Where do we gain our primary sense of identity today? And how might Jesus be inviting us to reorient our understanding of self in him and his self-giving love? If this world is all that there is and we have no higher calling and no better destination than this life as we know it now, then taking care of our families or being the best husband, wives, fathers, siblings, and spouses that we can be 
could properly be seen as the highest goal of them all. Those things certainly carry a very high value. But they do not carry the ultimate value. That value that we get from the kingdom of God and the higher calling that we have now as children of God. To be a disciple of Jesus, you must know that the cost will be putting Jesus first and other things after. That starts with the moment that you say yes to Jesus and it doesn't stop. There is no 401k plan for being a Christian. You don't retire from following Jesus to live off the investment of your accumulated past actions of discipleship. Jesus wants to do more for us than save us from our sins, as important as that is. He wants us to have abundant life here and now, to deepen our relationship with him and others as we grow in our faith. Jesus wants us to be his true disciples all in, to live by those counter-cultural values of the gospel so that his good news is spread. This isn't a one-time and you're done thing. It's an ongoing, day-by-day, moment-by-moment surrender to God's grace and his mercy. It's a daily choice an everyday choice to follow Jesus. In Christ, freedom comes from letting go. Freedom comes through giving away and trusting in Jesus first. In Christ, we are free people, free to choose life, free to choose faithfulness, and free to open our arms wide and receive the free grace of God. This from a God who chooses to never stop loving us. And that surely is good news. Amen.